In most countries in the world, certainly here in the UK, it is illegal for anyone to help a person die. Is that right? Several countries have now legalized assisted dying in slightly different forms, but for most people in the world, this is not something they will be able to access. So I want to ask if doctors should help their patients end their lives. That's the cheerful topic we'll be exploring today, and I know that those of us in the cold, winter, northern hemisphere might have wanted a lighter topic. But it's become a bit of a tradition for me to donate the proceeds from my end of year video to charity, so please do stick around to hear the sponsor read because your support will help a cause that I feel really strongly about for reasons that will become clear. And as I really do want to get this out in December, it might be a little bit shorter and simpler, don't, don't look at the runtime, than a proper deep dive, but I hope that means that more people watch because this is a topic that can affect any of us or our loved ones. My intention with this channel has always been to tackle topics that aren't typical for medical YouTubers uh, or medics on social media, so my sincere apologies for not sharing my morning routine or reacting to funny TikToks, but you and I, we have dabbled in illegal drugs, corruption, research fraud, and this isn't the first time I'm talking about death, but this video is different to any I've made before. It's been a long-running joke on the channel that I am not a vlogger, even though Jushan Ashwin edited my Wikipedia entry to include the word, don't think I've forgotten. What's even worse is that my kids have now discovered that they can ask Alexa who I am and it reads this out, so all I can say, Jushan Ashwin, is well played, you bastard. Now, it's not that I've got anything against vloggers, that's a lie, but because I have never wanted this channel to be about me personally, I keep my own life offline and I think of myself like a presenter rather than the subject, foolishly issuing the parasocial potential of being a content creator, no doubt. But this video is actually extremely personal, and it's taken me several years to feel ready to talk about it, because it's about my family. My name is Rohan, I'm a doctor in the UK, and I work in a field where I talk to patients about death on a daily basis. I deliver the worst news that anyone can hear, regularly, and I've seen hundreds if not thousands of my patients die some peacefully, some with appalling suffering. I'm also a son that cared for his mother as she died of a terminal illness. She wanted me to use my position as a doctor to push for a change in the law. She didn't know I was also going to become a YouTuber as well, so I guess now I have an ability to reach lots of people about something that I consider one of the most important ethical considerations in medicine. So. Should my profession be offering some terminally ill patients assistance to die on their own terms? Other countries do things differently, and we will look at those as well. Initially, I thought I'd try and bring a kind of journalistic neutrality to this and let you reach your own conclusions. And while I do want you to make your own decision, I realised that me telling my story of why I feel so strongly about this would make my motivation very obvious. So, like the television news, my impartiality would be concocted. Besides, you can read a newspaper for a journalistic take. I figured that this one should come from the heart. My heart. Now, I'm going to present the case for, and I'm going to attempt to steel man the best arguments against. I really want to hear your thoughts on whether you feel I've been fair, but first, I have to tell you about my mum. It all started with a prawn. We were out for a family meal in 2016 and mum, who loved nothing more than good food and good company and good wine, ordered her favourite food. She gave us all a scare when she choked on a prawn, so much so I'd leapt out of my chair about to give her the Heimlich manoeuvre before, thankfully, she started breathing again. That had never happened before, but hey, it's just one of those things and we thought nothing more of it. Until it happened again a few weeks later. After several episodes of coughing and choking, even when drinking water, she went to see her doctor. What followed was nine months of being bounced between medical specialties, receiving what we call in the profession dustbin diagnoses. Things you come up with, ideally under another team's care, when you haven't got a clue what's going on. Respiratory said her fatigue and breathlessness was due to her weight. Ear, nose and throat said she might have had a stroke. And gastroenterology thought her symptoms were due to dehydration. Dehydration. I honestly don't know how some of my colleagues can feel satisfied talking such rubbish. Finally, it was me that figured it out. 
There's a very unique sorrow that comes with being a medically trained person and being blind to what's going on with a family member because you can't separate yourself, you can't see things dispassionately. And that's actually why we have laws and rules about treating your family. But nevertheless, I was racked with guilt that it had taken me so long. It also left me feeling despondent with the medical profession. But in fact, if you look up her diagnosis in textbooks, the average time to a definitive diagnosis is about nine months because it's a tricky one to recognize in those early stages. She had something called progressive bulbar palsy, which is a type of motor neuron disease, similar to the ALS of Ice Bucket Challenge fame a few years ago. It's a rare disease that attacks the muscles of speech, swallowing and breathing. It is incurable and it causes death within about one to three years. My mother didn't have an easy life. She lost her own mother um, at the age of nine to a medical complication. And she was forced to take on parental responsibility for her younger sisters, one of whom contracted childhood encephalitis and was permanently brain damaged. My elder brother was born with severe learning disabilities and is fully dependent for his daily care, which caused mum to have to give up a career as a clinical psychologist in India that she had barely even started. Then I arrived in the 80s and I was also a um, challenging child to raise, hashtag basically likable, never forget. ADHD and neurodiversity weren't really a thing in the 1980s and, and 90s. In spite of all this, she was always full of joy and love. I inherited my love of food and my sense of fun from mum. What? I'm fun. I'm a goddamn joy. I am levity personified. She was happiest laughing loudly with her family or friends. My mother dedicated her life to her boys. She cared for my brother every day for 40 years until her illness made it impossible. And she often talked about how she wanted to outlive him because he'd never known life without her. That wasn't going to be the case. But I was now grown up, I was training as a cardiologist, and I was starting my own family. So mum felt she had done her duty as a mum, and she had no fear of death. She struggled a lot with depression in her life, and I think she really only lived for her sons. She knew that I had established myself and I was going to look after my brother. So she was at peace with the fact that she would die. But she did have a fear that completely overwhelmed her in her final year, a fear of suffering. We will all die, hopefully at a grand old age in our sleep with no unpleasant prodrome. Terminal illness doesn't offer this whether it's cancer, motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, organ failure, Huntingdon's, Alzheimer's. You have to face the fact that the end is coming and it will bring months or years of pain and suffering beforehand. Mum was one of the most emotionally tough people I have known, but she spent her final year crippled by anxiety and petrified about how she would go. In spite of her son being a doctor, she'd always been very anxious when it came to anything medical, and 10 years earlier she had watched her younger sister and her brother-in-law slowly fade away and die from cancer. Motor neuron disease inexorably renders your muscles useless. Progressive bulbar palsy, which mum had, has a predilection for the muscles of speech and swallowing. And it was a cruel irony that someone who loved chatting to and eating with friends so much was robbed of her ability to do both. She had to communicate via a writing pad until of course she lost the ability to move her hands as well. And she rapidly lost weight because she couldn't eat anything and she didn't want to have a feeding tube to prolong her life artificially. But worse than even those, your breathing muscles become affected. Breathlessness relentlessly increases until you can't even catch your breath sitting still. You can't complete a sentence. And then finally, you are suffocated to death or you die of a chest infection because you can't ventilate your lungs. Mum used a CPAP mask, a non-invasive ventilator, to assist her breathing, which she became increasingly dependent on, having to use it almost continuously. It's a horrible way to go. She was scared and every time we would see the neurologist, she would ask for reassurance that she wouldn't suffer. It started to consume her. And it's really hard seeing your mum like this. 
The neurologist had nothing to say because he simply couldn't guarantee that she wouldn't suffer. In a way, there's a simplicity to a disease with no cure. I am at least grateful that she didn't have to go through something like chemotherapy, which I think she would have really found challenging. Mum would joke with me that maybe I could swipe something from the hospital and put her out of her misery. She would pull my leg that Michael Jackson's cardiologist put him to sleep permanently with a lethal injection, and her own son, being a cardiologist, clearly didn't love her enough. She was joking, of course, and she would never want me to jeopardise my career, but as the months went by, I could detect there was a part of her that wasn't joking, which grew each time. She and I began researching assisted dying. So first let me explain some terminology. Assisted dying is the term given to medical assistance to bring about death in a person who is terminally ill and fully mentally competent. This is what I am in favour of legalising, as it has been in several places in the world, successfully and safely. Opponents often refer to it as assisted suicide, but someone with a terminal illness who wants to control their own death is not suicidal. Opponents often also deliberately conflate it with euthanasia, which is different. Euthanasia is the act of ending someone's life to alleviate suffering without necessarily the stipulation of a limited life expectancy. It can be classed as voluntary or involuntary, i.e. without their consent, which is not legal anywhere in the world. Now, I am not trying to introduce euthanasia into the UK, and administering something to end someone's life without their consent is not assisted dying. Sometimes patients in comas might have treatment withheld, and this is legal in many places. This is allowing a natural death, for example, switching off the ventilator for someone with irreversible brain damage that cannot breathe unaided. What I am proposing is only for patients who are mentally competent, they can make their own decisions. In a way, I actually feel quite confident that most people watching this video will agree with me. A survey by the charity Dignity in Dying found that 84% of the British public support having the choice of assisted dying, with an independent Ipsos poll also finding that 65% of people believe that assisted dying should be legal. And yet the law in the UK currently states that it is illegal for anyone, including doctors, to help a person die. People who want to decide how they die either face travelling abroad at great expense, which I'll talk about in a minute, or attempting to take their own lives at home, which can lead to a painful, uncomfortable controlled death. At least 300 terminally ill people do this each year in the UK. I came to support dignity in dying and actively work for doctor-assisted dying. When a, the wife of a friend of mine, in terrible pain and yet uh, still alive, wanted to end her life. But she could not do it here in the UK, and she could not travel abroad to do that. And she did not want in any way to put the life of her husband or other members of her family at risk. So one night, while her husband was out walking the dog, she put a plastic bag over her head and knotted it tight. And that was how her husband found her. That anyone alone should have to suffer in such a way is a crime. Millions of people in Oregon, Washington, California, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Switzerland can benefit from assisted dying. And the slippery slope that opponents of assisted dying talk of has not materialised in these countries. I mentioned going abroad to die, which itself is a bizarre sentence to even say, but you might be aware of a company called Dignitas in Switzerland, which offers terminally ill patients an opportunity to take control of their own death, and thousands of people from other countries go to Switzerland for this purpose every year. But it is very expensive, in the region of £15,000 when you factor in all the preparatory work, the fee, and travel. Mum and I had talked about it, but the journey itself is difficult when you are sick. She quickly became too frail and unwell to travel. Therefore, people end up going earlier in the course of their disease, instead of having some extra quality time at home with their family, knowing that they could achieve a comfortable death in their own home, in their own country. And of course, many can simply not afford it, or they want to leave whatever money they have to their family. Something like this shouldn't depend on how rich you are. 
Furthermore, current guidance from the General Medical Council, which uh, governs the conduct of doctors in the UK, recommends that doctors do not support patients seeking this option by even supplying medical records. It's discretionary, but that is the guidance. I know of at least one doctor, now retired, who told me that he illegally supplied a patient a way for them to end their lives painlessly. Currently, if a husband, for example, watching his wife for 50 years go through hell and in pain acts out of nothing but compassion and administers a lethal dose of a drug with her consent, he could be imprisoned for 14 years. Now, to be clear, I am not suggesting that he should be allowed to do that, even though I think 14 years is hugely disproportionate, but what I'm saying is he shouldn't have to do it in the first place. However, it's fair to say that the police and the Crown Prosecution Service have, on the whole, taken a humane approach. Out of 170 72 cases of so-called mercy killing referred to the police in 10 years or so, 113 were not proceeded with, and 32 more were withdrawn by the police. Graham Mansfield, who was married to his wife Diane for 41 years, killed her and attempted to take his own life, but survived. He was cleared of murder but convicted of manslaughter and given a suspended sentence by the judge who said in his sentencing that it was clear that he was acting out of love as his wife was in intractable, terrible pain from cancer and was estimated to have less than a month to live. Graham said that he would do it all over again. And he's also argued for a change in the law saying, I don't have all the answers, but I think if you have a terminal illness and you're in the latter stages, maybe in the last six months, and if you can get two independent doctors to talk to that person who wants to die, talk to their family and their friends, maybe get the police to do some sort of investigation, and they all come to the same conclusion that they're fed up, that there's no quality of life, and they, they should be allowed to die. We would have much preferred to have, say, Diane lying in bed upstairs, me holding her hand and somebody administering a lethal injection. That would have been a far more humane way of doing things. He thinks it's unfair that animals receive more dignified deaths than humans. People say, you can't leave your dog like that, it's not right, we'll go and put, put the dog to sleep. But you can't do that with humans. In spite of growing public support, doctors have historically remained quite silent. When I appeared in a leaflet produced by Healthcare Professionals for Assisted Dying, which is allied to Dignity in Dying, a few years ago, it was something that was sent out to all the subscribers of the BMJ, I noted that most of the other doctors willing to show their support publicly were quite senior or even peri-retirement, with me, I think, as the only junior doctor. In my experience, few are willing to speak out in favour of this publicly. It's still kind of a controversial topic to advocate for, especially at a junior level with potential career repercussions. However, things are changing. In the last few years, the Royal Colleges of Physicians, Surgeons, the Nursing and Midwifery Council, the British Medical Association and other bodies have moved from a previously held position of opposition to one of neutrality, meaning they are neither for nor against. An assisted dying law can also enable people to have better conversations about death, something that we do really badly in most countries, certainly here in the UK. So that's a bit of an overview of why I think things need to change. Let's try to now, in as good faith as possible, consider some of the arguments against. It may not be exhaustive, but I, I've tried my best. The first is the slippery slope argument, that legalising assisted dying will lead to the law expanding to include those with disabilities or cognitive impairment or people who are unconscious, that doctors will start acting like the Grim Reaper and kill whomsoever they deem unworthy of living. Now this actually I think is, is the weakest argument. By this rationale, any change to how things are done could be claimed as the start of a slippery slope to some undesirable destination. That legalising one thing will lead to another, like legalising assisted dying inevitably leads to eugenics. But this is patently absurd, because you could say the same about any change in the law over the centuries. Changing the law incrementally and with democratic input at each step and not falling inescapably past a moral event horizon and down a slippery slope with no control, that's just simply how society evolves one step at a time. It doesn't mean you're going to slide uncontrollably. When people campaigned for same-sex marriage to be legalised, opponents claimed it would lead to the complete breakdown of marriage. And when researching this, I learned that apparently serious academics and politicians claimed that there would be a slippery slope that would lead to adults marrying children or their pets. Now, one of the people that said this, by the way, is the current Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, just by the way, and he said that in 2005. Let's not digress. 
For assisted dying, the slippery slope has been mentioned frequently by politicians in the UK, where it remains illegal, and in Australia, where voluntary assisted dying has been legalised in all states over the last few years, and I'm sure in other countries too, but I was looking um, through some of the parliamentary proceedings in, in those two. For this claim to hold water, you would need to show that change A leads to outcome B with some empirical evidence. When talking about the extremes, like killing the disabled, there's clearly no such link. But let's examine more moderate claims. Opponents of assisted dying show data from the Netherlands and Belgium, and more recently Canada, as evidence that normalising assisted dying will cause more people to pursue it. They show graphs that show that numbers have indeed gone up year on year since legalisation. But is that surprising? Things tend to happen more after they are legalised. Indeed, if we go back to the um, analogy of same-sex marriage, We've seen that that went up after it was legalised, but the slippery slope never emerged. Chronic disease is increasing, the population is ageing, access to assisted dying has improved, so an increase in numbers in itself is not evidence of harm. I don't feel that normalisation as a concept in itself should be the worry, unless the thing being normalised is proven to be bad. Now, some of you might be imagining the future armour suicide booths, but rest assured, the decision cannot be made on a whim. The process is lengthy, with mandated palliative care and counselling. It should also be pointed out that these three countries have the widest assisted dying and euthanasia laws, fundamentally very different to what is being proposed for the UK, which is very close to the Oregon model, one that has been running for uh, many as 30 years smoothly, um, and California and Washington have more recently introduced similar laws based on Oregon because it works well. In the whole time, there have been no abuses of the law, no widening, it remains strictly for mentally competent, terminally ill patients. It's worth reading the details of the law in Oregon because it really goes into depth to ensure that this is safe. While we're talking of disability and eugenics, you recall that I mentioned my brother, who is pretty much the reason that I became a doctor. He has profound intellectual disability, he cannot give consent for anything, I'm his legal guardian, I make all medical decisions for him. Now, if I felt that there was a danger that someone like him could be euthanized, I would of course never support this. But this is a completely factuous argument because there are rigorous safeguards in the law. Another argument is that assisted dying will change society's attitude to the disabled or the elderly or those who have disease and that pressure might be exerted on them to avoid being a burden, or that families might pressurise parents to take this option. But these kinds of worries, which might sound reasonable when somebody raises them, don't have to be postulated as, as hypotheticals. We can look to the regions where assisted dying is legal. We don't have to operate in an evidence-free zone anymore to see there is no evidence of this happening, and that safeguards work well. Switzerland has many, many years of data, and every case, I didn't realise this until researching this, every case referred to Dignitas is investigated by the police and the coroner without any evidence of coercion ever being found. Next comes the claim that high quality palliative care can alleviate distressing symptoms associated with the dying process, so what we should be campaigning for is better access to palliative care. Now, I wholeheartedly agree with the second point there. Absolutely, palliative care is the field of medicine related to dying. Palliative doctors and nurses and, and practitioners are absolutely invaluable and can make an unquantifiable difference in the lives of dying people and their families. And I hope it is clear that I have the utmost respect and gratitude personally for the field and how important it is. Assisted dying is not an alternative to palliative care, and it is simply an additional option. I do not in any way wish to replace palliative care, but it is fair to say that much of the most vociferous opposition to assisted dying frequently comes from palliative care physicians. The Association of Palliative Medicine in the UK has a strongly worded position statement in, in contrast to the ones I mentioned earlier, the other professional bodies, saying they are opposed to any change in the law and believe it is morally and clinically unacceptable for a doctor to assist a person in committing suicide, even if requested to do so by someone finding life intolerable at that time. Whenever there is a news article about assisted dying or a bill being discussed in Parliament, one can guarantee a letter in the time from a palliative care specialist in fierce opposition. So let's examine the claim. 
This year, the UK Parliament has been conducting its assisted dying inquiry, and I've used some excerpts from the multiple evidence sessions and presentations. Professor James Downer, who is head of the Division of Palliative Care at the University of Ottawa, explained that since the introduction of an assisted dying law in 2016, Canada has seen the strongest growth in palliative care in its history. Professor Jan Bernheim and Professor Rutger Jan van der Gaag said that legislative change in Belgium and the Netherlands has been intrinsically linked with palliative care, and they now boast some of the best palliative care provisions in Europe. Palliative care is vital. But just as in mum's case, modern medicine cannot alleviate all symptoms, and to pretend it can is unfair, nor can it relieve mental burden. Good palliative care can offer something so important, control. The lack of control is what ate away at my mum. Why do we only hope to give someone control over their symptoms, but not over something as fundamental as their own life? In countries where it has been legalised, public opinion clearly shows that what people value is knowing the option is there, even if they don't pursue it. The UK inquiry also heard that assisted dying is now available to 350 million people worldwide, and every jurisdiction that has introduced it wants to keep it. Now, this whole video is my personal opinion and should not be taken to represent the NHS or my hospital or any of the bodies mentioned, purely myself. But I want to especially stress that for this bit. An argument that I often hear from opponents to assisted dying is that it is simply crossing a line, crossing the Rubicon, for doctors to be involved in this. We should not be giving lethal medication, even though we do give lethal medication on a regular basis, just at a lower dose, but you know that's semantics and perhaps missing the point. What these people are saying is that it is fundamentally not a doctor's job. We should be trying to cure illness and not speeding up death. Okay. But what is this based on? As I have explained in a previous video, the phrase first do no harm has never appeared in the Hippocratic Oath. And indeed, most doctors no longer say any oath because we have a much more extensive and detailed code of conduct to adhere to. Every time a surgeon cuts into a patient, they are doing harm, but we all understand why they are doing it. And likewise, we understand the context of administering assisted dying is to save the patient from suffering. It's accepting that there are some things that we cannot fix. And instead of throwing our hands up and saying, there's nothing more we can do, we can still provide some help. Now, I have noted that much of the opposition to assisted dying comes from the religious. I have engaged with people at conferences and online, and I wish they would simply admit to this. Yet much of the time, lobby groups and vocal opponents make no mention of religion and instead talk of the sacred nature of human life. And when I've spoken to people individually, I know that they are deeply religious, but they don't declare this. The humanist movement, which is a non-religious philosophy placing human life at its centre, is very active in support of assisted dying. When I really try to pin down why some people are so against assisted dying, ultimately all they can say is that it is fundamentally wrong, without a more coherent argument. As if to say that suffering is an inevitable part of life and we simply cannot hope to alleviate it, or buying into the belief that suicide, which they perceive this to be, is fundamentally a sin, which is a common belief in many religions. It almost feels sometimes like the puritanical Mother Teresa attitude of suffering itself being something to be celebrated that can bring you closer to God. If medical professionals are going to be guided by religious beliefs, then they must say so and not hide behind pseudoscientific arguments. Doctors are entitled to their religious beliefs, of course, and nobody should be forced to give a therapy or even be involved if they don't wish to. But patients' beliefs might be quite different. Of course, this has some parallels with the recent discussions regarding abortion in the US. There are anti-abortion medical professionals who are even opposed when the mother's life is at risk, and almost all of these professionals are motivated by religious beliefs, and it's remarkable how similar arguments about sanctity are put forward in both cases, although I, I do think assisted dying is a far more straightforward and ethical question. I hope I haven't sort of muddied the waters by bringing up a, a whole different can of worms. I think this is, this is far more straightforward. 
So I disagree that this is a line that doctors cannot cross. I imagine I won't be called up to perform any of these if it becomes legal in the UK simply due to my line of work, but I certainly would be willing to if there was a rigorous system in place and we should all be clear that this must be well supported with all clinicians having adequate time and resources to do it properly and do what's right for all the patients who request it. Finally, much of the worry that I've seen in the press has been regarding euthanasia for pe people with purely mental illness. Even though every single bill and attempt to change the law in the UK has stipulated patients should be terminally physically ill with a limited life expectancy, and there has never been support for including mental illness in the UK. But let's take a look at this issue too. Even though I don't believe it's relevant to this country, it may well, um, you may be viewing in uh, the Benelux countries or Canada where it may be more relevant. Now, I support a law that requires not only is there a limited life expectancy, but for the person to be mentally competent and be assessed by multiple medical professionals, that there is a waiting period so no decision can be made rapidly. It requires agreement from a medical professional and a high court judge and allows the patient a chance to die at home. Severe mental illness might not be a terminal physical illness, but it is no less impactful on life. And it is, by definition, one of the leading causes of premature death, which is suicide. So should we be offering assisted dying for people who are depressed, for example? This is the case in Netherlands, Belgium, and since February of this year, Canada. Now, the argument for is that these people are already taking their own lives in large numbers, in violent or painful ways. So we would simply be easing that pain which is the same motivation as assisted dying for motor neuron disease, for example. But we know that you can never recover from motor neuron disease or metastatic cancer. You cannot categorically say that someone will not recover from depression. However, key to all of this is considering each case individually. And I think you can identify some people who simply wish to die and they have failed to respond to multiple treatments. My concern is that in countries like Canada or the US or the UK, accessing mental health care is extremely challenging for different reasons in each country. But the fact remains is that people might wait years or not be able to afford adequate care, which should not be a reason to choose assisted dying. Now, I'm not saying that there is evidence that this has occurred, but this is one concern that I can certainly understand and why I think that the case for assisted dying in the terminally ill is clear, but for the mentally ill, I think it is more subjective. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. Hello, this is Rohan from a slightly different point in time. Now, since recording this and posting the first version to Nebula, I've spoken to two Canadian healthcare professionals and I also had a Canadian man who has a disability email me. Um, now, perhaps I should have made this video solely focused on assisted dying for terminal illness, as that's where my passion to make change lies. But I did want to try and cover the wider conversation as well, because I think otherwise you, the, the viewer, probably would have left with some, some more questions. And, you know, I, I think you're probably interested. So I hope it hasn't made my message less clear. While the physician and nurse from Canada were in favour, the gentleman who emailed me, who I'll call Stephen, that's not his real name, raised some concerns, which I take seriously, that there are, of course, straightforward cases for the terminally ill. And I want to reiterate, this is where, what I am in support of, but there is clearly a more grey zone that does need further discussion. And Stephen said that some people he's aware of have had made suggested to them simply for being disabled, which is not only illegal, but morally appalling. Now, I've actually written an article a few years ago arguing a, a similar thing in the context of a do not resuscitate order. A man with Down syndrome was made not for resuscitation, which seemed like a reasonable decision based on the fact that he was fed through a tube and he was bed bound and had a, a marked deterioration in his quality of life. But on the do not resuscitate form, one of the reasons for not resuscitating was listed as Down syndrome, which is utterly unacceptable to write. The mere presence of a disability is not a reason to deny somebody life-saving treatment. So I believe Stephen when he says that some people, including doctors, can be immensely ignorant and insensitive towards disabled people. And indeed, I've been involved with educating my colleagues about disabled patients. He also highlighted some tragic examples of disabled people who often face great financial hardship, who are able to access MAID, sorry, MAID is what is referred to in Canada, 
but cannot access services that might help their disability, which is indeed the concern that I raised at the end there. An Ipsos poll this year found that 84% of Canadians supported the decision that had led to legalisation of euthanasia, 78% supported the removal of the requirement that natural death be reasonably foreseeable, i.e. expanding to beyond terminal illness. However, this might mask concerns among the among disabled people who are, of course, in minority. In the UK, about uh, almost 90% of disabled people surveyed have expressed support for assisted dying, but I'm pretty sure that that survey was specifically asking about terminal illness. Stephen voiced his support for that, but I'll actually use his own words, as I think he put it quite eloquently. The thing to stress is that it's all about choices being equally easy to make. It has to be as easy to choose to live as it is to choose to die. And this conundrum exists far less with terminally ill patients because they're not choosing to die. That choice has been made for them by their body. They're just choosing how. Now, obviously, I don't live in Canada, but I will continue to follow what's happening there closely. But what I want to see happen here is for a bill to be passed in the UK and other countries where the public support it to legalise medical assistance in dying for patients who are terminally ill. Thereafter, we can have further discussion about whether we wish to follow the example of places like Oregon, um, who have not expanded it, or to widen the eligibility. At present, I believe that people are using their opposition to the latter to prevent the acceptance of the former. And the losers are millions of people in the last months of their lives who are forced to suffer and, like my mum, not have control over their own deaths. Mum died in 2018. I had just uploaded my second video to YouTube and I was telling her that it's quite fun, and I think I might try to make some more. We were at home, we were looking over the garden that she loved so much, and worked on every weekend until she couldn't anymore. The wonderful and kind district nurse had given her a dose of morphine, a, a normal dose, to ease her shortness of breath, but with her precarious breathing, this was something that her colleagues had previously refused to administer. She and I knew that it could depress her breathing to the extent that it would stop and she passed away later that morning. Her final moments were peaceful, but it was preceded by a gruelling, painful and distressing year where she felt she lost not only her independence, but her dignity. I wish there was a way that I could rectify that, but I can't. I'm sorry, you're not supposed to see me blow my nose into scrubs. Um, Although I think I clean my motorcycle with these ones, so I better not use them. I'll be forever grateful that she got to meet at least one of her grandchildren, but she was heartbroken that she couldn't even hold him by that point. Her quality of life had gone. She spent her final months bedbound on a home ventilator, wasting away. Our goal in medicine is to heal the sick, but when that's not possible, we should prevent suffering. I was not able to give mum the death that she wanted but she knew that I may be able to influence opinion within my own profession so that others in her position don't have to... I think my bin just blew into the garage. <laughs> At this emotional juncture, um, I'm ruining the emotional climax of the video. Sorry, mum, let me start again. I was not able to give my mum the death that she wanted, but she knew that I may be able to influence opinion within my own profession so that others in her position don't have to end their lives in pain, anxiety and fear. The legal status and ability to access assisted dying is one of the most important medical ethical issues affecting us, and I hope that I have convinced you that terminally ill people in the UK or your own country should be able to die peacefully on their own terms, an option that millions of people in other countries now have. I'm donating the sponsorship fee that Nebula are giving me for this video to the Motor Neuron Disease Association, who fund research into finding a cure for this horrible disease, but also support people who have received a diagnosis of MND. Their work is vital, and there are some really exciting developments happening in research, but we're still a long, long way from an effective treatment. And I can do this because of people like you who have already signed up for Nebula. Now, you might have heard me talk about Nebula before, but 
Like this video, this sponsor segment is a bit different because 2023 has been a pretty huge year for Nebula, which is the streaming platform that I made with some creator friends where we post our own videos with tremendous freedom and support. This year we surpassed 700,000 active users, we've been covered in places like Variety and Decoder, been nominated for another streamy, again, actually our resident nature boy Tierzu won a streamy, congrats, and the British Film Institute recently postulated in their end of year retrospective that we might see a nebula style of video essay emerge because we have so much leading talent on the platform and we're a flourishing streaming service that gives creators so much more freedom to experiment than somewhere like YouTube. It really feels like things are taking off in a big way. It's really exciting. Nebula Studios has expanded massively and it doesn't just make one kind of thing. We've produced live shows, theatrical movies, game shows, one of which is the globetrotting sensation that is jet lag now in its eighth season, incredible video essays from people like Lindsay Ellis, all of which you can only see on Nebula. I particularly love Wendover's logistics series and Polymatter's perception challenging China actually, but you know, I'm a sucker for geopolitics and economics. Just look at the banner right now. This is only December. As for me, 2023 has been a source of frustration when it comes to making videos due to my increasingly all-consuming work where I feel like I do more admin and less doctoring every day, but that means that income from YouTube itself is minimal. And I've never asked any of you to donate to me directly, but it does mean that the channel is more dependent than ever on the sponsorship and direct payment that I get from Nebula. So why not treat yourself or a friend to a Nebula subscription, enjoy all of those juicy titles in front of the TV this festive season, and know that you are helping me to continue making videos in 2024. So click the link below or scan the QR code. It'll be on screen somewhere. I don't know where. I don't have the higher executive function to be able to plan these things in advance. But you got to use my code. You have to use my code or Wendover Productions makes me sleep under the stairs. And you can sign up for as little as $5 a month. Actually, $2.50 a month. I didn't realize we'd drop the price. But for December only, i.e., yes, I know, just barely a few days because I couldn't upload this any sooner. I'm sorry, all right? But for December only, you can get a lifetime subscription to Nebula. Click the other link or use an entirely separate QR code. It'll make it, I'll sort it out in the edit. Um, it's $300. But that's it. You never have to think about paying anything ever again. What a gift. Every time we run this promo, we're inundated because this directly funds even more ambitious projects like Archaeology Quest. <laughs> also, if you signed up with the Curiosity Stream bundle, that is ending. So if you switch to a direct Nebula subscription, you'll sign up and pay today, but we won't start the clock until your bundle access expires. So. We welcome you all, and there's also a, a thriving subreddit now as well. So come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, come ye, oh come ye, to Nebula. All right, before I slip into complete mania, I'll be real with you. I'm kind of nervous about putting so much personal information on YouTube in this video, but it's a one-off and I hope it prompts at least some conversations. So all that's left for me to do is wish you all the very best festive wishes, happy Christmas, and I'll see you in 2024.